so today's subject I'm going to talk about today is the professional squatter. Someone who stays in their home and tries every single possible strategy that they can think of to stay in their house. The reason we call them professional squatters is because what they normally do is they stop making payments on their home, they end up in foreclosure, they use eviction moratoriums to slow the process down, they know how to file a bankruptcy or use a modification or a short sale as a tool to allow them to stay in their home as long as possible. Let me give you an example of this. I had a property that uh, an HOA foreclosed upon uh, many years ago and the HOA got tired of working with the individual to get them to pay on their home or to try to get them to move out and so this went on for years and based on that they sold us this property because they no longer wanted to deal with the individual that was inside. We took this property over and we found several things. Number one, we found that their loan, which was estimated to be about an $88,000 payoff, ended up being over $220,000 with principal and interest in arrears. And so all the equity in this house was basically gone. The individual inside the home, her father died several years ago, and when the father died, she never made a payment on the loan, as far as we can tell. So she stopped making payments on her HOA, she stopped making payments on her loan, and she basically stayed in the home for years. This is a good example of a person who is in a distressed position, or in this case, a professional squatter. The minute a person starts to miss payments on their home, they immediately start to take advantage of a financial windfall, so to speak, because if your monthly payment is 1500 bucks a month and you no longer make it and you do it for a year, you're going to save roughly $18,000. And if you do that for multiple years, every year you don't pay rent, you're actually putting money in your pocket. And so people that are like this and do this as almost what you call a profession, get really good at what they're doing. I've seen people that have filed multiple bankruptcies. I've seen um, one woman who didn't even live in the home, and every time someone tried to take it to foreclosure sale, she'd file a bankruptcy. Last time we checked, she had filed over six bankruptcies on her home to try to keep the house. And it was almost a game to her because she didn't even own the house, I mean, she didn't even live in the house anymore and she just kept filing bankruptcies to stop the sale. And the trustees just let her get away with it, basically. What they could have done is gone into the courts and filed a moratorium. I had a client recently in my system who had a squatter that, that originally purchased the home via a um, owner carryback. And so what she did is she sold it to the gentleman. He started making payments on the home. He got the deed or an option to buy the home at a certain time if he made enough payments. He moved into the house, started making payments. After a couple years, on a five-year term, he stopped making his payments, at which point he started to squat or stay in the home without making a payment. He, she actually went through the eviction process, paid the attorneys, got him out. When they got him out, it took several cops and a police helicopter and all kinds of people that were called in to try to get this, this person out of the home because he was trying to just stay in it and created all kinds of ruckuses to um, create a commotion, uh, threatening violence, this type of thing. And eventually they got him out of the house. What's even more important is a few days later, he drove back to the home and moved back in again and uh, she ended up having to go through the entire eviction process uh, again. She had problems with the district attorney. This happened to be in Texas, and to this day, the guy is still living in the home, and it's been over two years, and he hasn't paid any of his payments or his rents. So these guys get this idea of the fact that they can use the system to their advantage. So let's back up here and take a look at why this happens. The majority of the people who are in the business to buy a wholesale property, what they're doing is they're buying a piece of property from an individual who is in a distressed position. 
This person can be on drugs, have a drug addiction. They can be an alcoholic, have an alcoholic addiction. They can be going through a divorce. If they're going through a divorce and it's a really nasty, hostile divorce, the house can have equity in it and the husband and the wife get into fighting and arguing with each other. And once they fight and argue with each other, then it's, if I can't get the house, you're not gonna get the house. And so they get into this tug of war where there's $200,000 worth of equity sitting in the home and they're fighting about their children and their money and their finances. And the next thing you know, they're gonna kill each other over the fact that no one's gonna get the equity in the home. When these types of situations exist, it creates a distressed property situation. They stop making payments on the house. They destroy each other's credit and they go to court and fight with each other and it just creates all kinds of commotion. You see it with health issues, sickness. Uh, people get sick, they can no longer work. They start to not be able to manage their financial affairs and they physically break down. It can happen from people that go into jail. They commit a crime, they end up in a position where they have a house that's paid for and they end up in jail. And when they end up in jail, the payments on the home can't be made and for different reasons, they start to lose the asset. So when you're buying a property in a wholesale position, in most cases, the person on the other side cannot financially manage their asset correctly. Okay, and let me show you how this kind of breaks down. With a back-end story of this particular person in Texas, this uh, individual was a child of a father who owned the home and the father passed away and died. The child then inherited the house and this child did not have the means to make the payment to the same extent that her father did. So she became an heir to the asset. He passed away so he could no longer make the payment on the home. The heir then took the house over and could not make the payment. So the strategy of the heir was to stay in the home as long as feasibly possible. Okay, so what they do is, is they prey upon the goodwill or the grace of God that's within people or humanity and how they feel that they should take care of people and use that to their advantage in the situation. So what I would say is what probably happened is the people that were running the HOA, eventually they got tired of this woman not making the HOA payment, her house was in disrepair or she wasn't mowing the lawn or she could have flat out been maintaining the house and just completely stopped making the payment. Just completely stopped making the payment. When this occurs, then what happens is over time that HOA can go in and foreclose on the home. And in this case, it can happen with a mortgage, it can happen with a tax lien. All of these are primary ways that this happens. So it could be simply that she's missing a mortgage and she starts to go into a cycle of stopping making payments with the bank. As this process occurs, what they start to learn is that it's kind of like when you do something for the first time. So if you're not a smoker and you decide to take a drag on a cigarette, you all of a sudden have crossed that barrier of, of where you didn't smoke to where now you have smoked. And as that occurs, then it's easier to smoke again. It's the same principle in this particular case when someone stops making a payment, what occurs is that they realize that they just saved themselves $1,500. And once they do that, then their mindset goes to the next step, which is, hey, I can do this on a regular basis. My bank doesn't foreclose on me right away. And as that starts to happen, then they, they learn other things that they can do to be able to make themselves money or to reduce the amount of money that they're paying to the mortgage. What I can tell you is I've seen people that have missed payments for 10 years and the bank never foreclosed upon them. And I've seen where the arrearage is more than the principal amount of the property. So think about that strategy. If you stop making a $1,500 a month payment, and you, let's say your house is worth 200,000, and you miss a full year's payments, that's $18,000. And if you did that for 10 years, you effectively have gotten away with not making $180,000 worth of payments. If it was five years on that strategy, you got away with not making $90,000 in payments. And that doesn't include your, uh, your late fees and all the other things that start to add up with missing a payment.
right? So strategically what they find is, is that they, they go into a position, they're not making a payment, whatever it is, it's a tax payment, it's a mortgage payment, it's an HOA payment, it's some type of judgment they got. In this case, the person inherited the home from their mother or their father, they can't make the payments, and what starts to happen is that all of the bills go in arrear. The mortgage payment can go in arrears, the taxes go in arrears, the HOA goes in arrears, and then it's just a matter of who's going to foreclose first, right? And so, in this particular case, what she started to do is she started to miss payments on probably all fronts, and as she did that, then she started to execute on strategies that allowed her to stay in the home longer. If someone filed a motion against her in court, she goes in and she says, these guys are kicking me out of my house. The other thing is, is the body of politic out there, the judges, the people that are in these places, they see this individual for the first time and they feel sorry for him. And so it's real easy for them to not execute on the law appropriately. So even though the law says one thing, the judge will unilaterally make a decision that puts the business owner in a, in a negative position. And so when this starts to occur, there are many people in the community or the society that believes that what they're going to do is help an individual out who's in a bad position or a distressed position. And when that individual learns how to take advantage of that situation, which they often do, then they can start to accelerate that and multiply it and make it many things that it's not. So in this particular case, the, I'm sure this lady ran the bank, the taxes, and the HOA around the corner. She can go to the taxing entity and say, listen, I'll get on a payment plan. So where the taxes are $200 a month, she'll pay 100 a month and let that to continue to go into arrears. Um, and then if she's smart at what she does, she can go in and she can see how long she can push that taxing entity to be able to allow them to not foreclose on her and still get what she wants to kick it down the road. She can do the same thing with her HOA. A lot of times the HOA is a community of in individuals that are not pro on foreclosing on the people that are in their community. They have bleeding hearts or hearts where they want to try to help them out so she can start to leverage the HOA and not pay that for years. And then when they go to foreclose on her or evict her or get her in compliance, she can go in and plead the, that the HOA is taking advantage of her and, and this little sum of money that's owed is something that she, sh she should not be booted out of her house for. It's the same thing with a mortgage company. In this particular case, her loan was $112,500. Her uh, amortized loan balance was $88,000. When we received the mortgage statement, she was $222,000 in arrears on that property with the principal and all the late fees and everything she owed. There was no way she was ever going to pay this off. So what you see is this starts to become a professional squatter. They go in, they use all kinds of methods to try to stop the court and to prey upon your goodwill. And they will use it over and over and over to trigger you. In this particular case, we got a hold of this asset. One of my clients took possession of it. They went in and got the mortgage statement where they asked how much was owed on the bank. The bank sent them a payoff of $715,000. It blew my client out of the water. It was a $250,000 home, right? So we had to go back in and communicate with the bank and say, why did you give them a payment of $715,000? This house only had a lien of $112,500 on it. That was eventually adjusted and they sent a corrective notice where there was $222,000. It makes you think what is going on between the bank and the homeowner. How long has this homeowner been playing the bank is there a possibility that there's multiple debts that are owed? There's some cross collateralization. There's some type of an agreement out there to where they were using other assets or other stratagems to be able to get this bank in a position where they were owed lots of money. Who knows, her father may have very well been a perpetual uh, squatter, right? A professional squatter. Um, and so this may have been perpetuated through actual heirs of assets from father to daughter type strategy. You don't think this is possible? It really is. So at the end of the day, what happens is we take control of the asset, we start executing. 
you can imagine how I feel. Well, let me be real clear with you. When I'm working with someone who is a professional squatter, or anyone for that matter, I have found that the smartest thing to do is to apply the law to its greatest effect. So what do we do? We go in and file a notice to quit, a notice to vacate, whatever it is, an abandonment notice, whatever notice that the law requires in that state, I immediately apply pressure through the law. We go in and we sue her. We move forward with trying to evict her. This is what we call using the strategy of leveraging against the eviction. In general, when you try to get someone to do something that they do not want to do, you normally think that you can get them to make the decision out of goodwill. That does not work. Most people in this type of situation need to be compelled to move. So they have to have the heat ratcheted up on them high enough to be able to know that they have no other choice. So a lot of times people move when they're forced to move. And as, as humanity, we don't like to force people to move. We like people to move because they choose to move and they do it out of respect. And when you're dealing with these types of individuals, you have to turn the heat up high enough to where they will actually realize that they can't play the game any longer. So in this particular case in Texas, we filed an eviction. COVID hit. When COVID hit, it added probably six months to eight months on to the eviction because now everyone goes in and says, we have a, an infection or a disease or whatever they call it in their mind's eye. We, in their mind's eye, we can't possibly evict these people. We gotta keep them in their home. That's that humanity side of things that we're gonna help people. So what does she do? She now gets eight months, a year, whatever that amount of time is. She uses the COVID excuse. Right now in the country, we're seeing this all over the place. People are using COVID to not go to court, COVID to not go to work, COVID to get extra money from the government, COVID to not be evicted, COVID, 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 COVID. This is a stratagem and it doesn't have to be COVID, it's some other type of method or something that they've found that they can use to rely upon to get this deal done for them, so to speak, as a professional squad, right? So in this particular case, you got several months through that stratagem, the courts were shut down, yada, 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 time rolls by, every month she's in that home, she knows she's saving $1,500. Think about that for a minute. If you can roll in $1,500 into your bank account every month, that's not a bad gig for doing virtually almost nothing, right? And using the system to make it possible for you to stay in that home because you can't possibly be kicked out onto the street, right? And so in this particular case, what happens? She uses the COVID. We go in, we file a motion. What does she do? We, the judge renders that we get the eviction, right? The next strategy is, okay, we've got an eviction. She's gonna appeal the eviction process. When she appeals the eviction process, she's required to post a bond. But this little fancy term in Texas called a popper's affidavit. We actually stood in front of a judge who told us that anyone who comes in with a pauper's affidavit, she's going to allow that person to stay in the home without posting a bond. Because that's exactly what a pauper's affidavit does. It allows you to appeal the case and because you're poor, you no longer have to make the payment on the bond, which puts the investor at risk. So she files her pauper's affidavit, goes in and sits on the stand, says she has no money, even though she's saving $1,500 a month, she's broke. It's funny, the day we evicted her, which was yesterday, she pulled out of the driveway in a Lexus of all cars. Imagine that, right? We've actually had people that drove two Mercedes Benz, newer cars, and the guys walked into court and said he's broke. And the judge said, I've never not allowed a pauper's affidavit, so we're going to give him one. So you have judges on the bench right now that are bleeding heart. They're, they're activists for the, those who are poor or cannot make it, so to speak. 
And so these judges will actually impede your progress into getting someone out of the home and actually enable the individual to move down the road even further to get where they want to go. In this particular case, she filed a pauper's affidavit that eliminated her bond, so she had to post no cash. Then she went in and appealed it. She lost the appeal. Once she lost the appeal, her, her next method of attack was, hey, listen, I paid the HOA all the money. I was on a payment plan. They didn't receive my check. And because they didn't receive my check, they lost it, and it was their fault. And so now she, her next thing is, is she files a temporary restraining order right before the evic eviction is going to happen. She goes into the court. She pleads her case and says, listen, judge, I'm going to get kicked out on the street. I need to be able to have a way to stay in this home while I fight this mean old nasty HOA that's trying to take my house for $5,000 worth of arrearages, right? So the bleeding heart judge gives her time, says, let's go ahead and litigate this case. It doesn't stop there. So what does she do? She files a temporary restraining order, sues the HOA and us. Now get that one. Now this person's gonna sue us who purchased the home from the HOA. Never had a problem with this before. We could purchase it on a tax sale, a mortgage, it's the same thing. You might as well sue everyone if you're gonna sue someone. So she goes in, pulls everyone on a lawsuit. Once she pulls them in on that lawsuit, then what happens is she sues them for wrongful foreclosure, right? And that requires a judge and discovery and all of these things, depositions and a fight in the courts, right? She does it pro se. So what does she do? She goes in pro se means she represents herself, right? That saves her attorney fees and then she uses an attorney to educate her on what to say and how to say it to get her to the next step. In this particular case, that's exactly what she did. She filed a temporary restraining order, sued the HOA, us, and everyone she could think of, and said we were all bad guys kicking her out of her house. She brings all, she alleges all kinds of defenses, and now she's headed to make more time, right? You get a bleeding heart judge. Okay, let's go ahead and hear this case. So in the meantime, as she's filing a temporary restraining order, she's suing everyone. We're able to beat her strategically through the court system because we know the law better than she does. What's really funny about this is even the people that I've talked to and known forever will make the exact same mistake and they become a bleeding heart. I watched my attorney go on vacation and she had another attorney sub in for her. That attorney went to court and listened to this woman plead her case. The judge looked at her and him and said, I cannot believe that an HOA foreclosed on this woman for $5,000. It's unconscionable. Where's the judge's mind on this one? Did he forget that this woman was playing the HOA for many years and didn't pay a single dime? Did he understand that that was her mantra? You don't get kicked out of a house because your HOA is being mean to you. You get kicked out of the house because you're not doing what you're supposed to, right? And there can be arguments. Don't get me wrong, I hate HOAs. But at the end of the day, there can be arguments all day long. It's the same thing with taxes and mortgage foreclosures, right? So now what you have is a woman who goes in and gets the judge to see her way. So what do they do? They extend that hearing out. They move the, kick the can down the road, move the ball down the road. We beat her procedurally. We come in and say, judge, here's the law. You have to comply with the law. The judge, against his better will and humanity, finally rules in our favor, right? So we set up the eviction. We're now ready to kick this woman out of the house. Notice the way I said that. I didn't say, let's remove her nicely. I said, kick her out of the house. And the reason I say that is because the next step is she files an emergency motion to have the case reheard. And so the case is reheard, the date is set, but she doesn't get the right documentation to stop the eviction. So she has a hearing on the 27th of this month, but she has no order from the judge stopping the eviction. 
we move forward on the eviction and we think we're good. We'll evict her tomorrow morning at Monday at 8 a.m. Now let me back up for a second here. The minute the judge said that that deal was unconscionable, he looked at my attorney and said, you need to go figure out a way to settle with this woman or make it right with her. Where is your brain? Make it right with her? This is the dregs of humanity. This is a woman who's a professional squatter and I'm supposed to go meet her. I get the attorney walk outside of court and he calls me and says, we got to do something to settle with this woman and help her out here because the judge says we better or otherwise he's not going to rule favorably. She's going to litigate forever with us. That's what he tells me. He actually sends me an email with three options for settlement. Do I think this lady's going to settle? Not on your life. She's going to play him like a violin. What's even worse about it, the guy that works for me, or with me, I should say, also starts to get a bleeding heart because he sees what the judge does, and when he sees what the judge does and that it's unconscionable, then he starts to feel the pressure or the leverage applied to him to relinquish with the attorney. I'm like, what are you doing? You've been in this place many times before. Don't let this stuff get you. This is all part of the play, bro. You gotta wake up, right? So then they start to think we should settle. I'm like, snap out of this, guys. I go to the attorney. We're not settling with her. We're moving full steam ahead. We're kicking this woman out. We want her to be knocked out of the house as quickly as possible because she's playing everyone. Then they catch on to that, realize what's going on. I have to wake up the very individuals who have many times had to evict people and they themselves fall into the trap. That's how bad this gets. Even the people that work on the other side get drug into it because the lady's singing some kind of song and dance. So finally what happens, the eviction's gonna happen and the constable shows up to the woman's house right? What do you think the woman's going to tell the constable? Man, these guys kicked me out of my house. My father died. My father died. I'm in all of these positions where I'm going to lose my home and be put out on the street as she smokes her pot inside the house, right? So she's got this whole story. These guys are terrible. They're evicting me. They're shrewd. I can't believe they would do something. So the constable comes back and picks up the phone and calls my guy and says, what, says well, the eviction's scheduled but for Thursday, but we're going to put it off to a Monday. And my guy says, well, why are you putting it off to a Monday? Because I, basically what he's saying is, I heard the story of the woman and I think you guys are taking advantage of her, right? So he plays the humanitarian game as well too. My guy comes back and says, well, no, we really need it scheduled for Thursday. What I finally had to tell him is, bro, you got to fight fire with fire. When the constable walks up to the door, you know what story is going to be pitched. You got to be ready for this. What you got to do is you got to go in and you got to say to the constable when he calls and says, I'm going to back up your date. What you need to say right when he picks up the phone is, hey, did you hear the story? What story? Did you hear about this woman, about how she's going to get kicked out and she's been not making her payments for five years and she's dragged the HOA, the tax venue, the mortgage company and everyone on the street through every kind of legal litigation you can possibly think of. She's bent every single pleading heart that's out there. She's got the judges to rule in her favor. She's got the people at the HOA that feel sorry for her. She's got the taxing entities She's playing at the mortgage company. Who has this woman not played? All because her father died decades ago. You get the message, right? Even though it's not decades, you know where I'm headed with that, right? At the end of the day, what you have to do is you have to counter her fire with a greater fire. Basically what I said is, you go in and you lay the story out. Did she give you a sob story? Well, here's the truth, right? If you do that, the date doesn't get bumped to a Thursday to a Monday. What does that mean to us? Well, let me tell you, in Texas, over the last several days, it's rained every day. In Texas, when you evict someone, you cannot evict them if it's raining on that day because you have to set all, take everything that's in the house 
and put it on the lawn and leave it there for 24 hours and then they can come get whatever they want. Okay, so what happens? He bumps the date from Thursday to Monday because of a bleeding heart. So how, how many times are we going to get beat to death by this woman, right? And then you're fearing that it's a rain day because it's rained 10 days out of the 11 days in this particular area of the state. So now what you're looking at is a rain day and a potential eviction. Now, do you think this is the last bullet in this woman's gun? If you do, you are deceived and as crazy as the rest of everyone who's listened to her the whole time. I said straight up, you watch, she's going to file another motion. She's going to pull another trick or rabbit out of her hat. Sunday night comes, and I, th th this just gets me, just to no end. This just burns me up to no end. I go to my attorney and I say, we need to file a temporary restraining order. And my attorney takes, says it's going to take five days to get it heard, right? Whenever I'm talking to my attorneys, they're always advising me to the law and how long it's going to take. And a temporary restraining order is going to take five days. Well, then I get this gal who goes in and hires another attorney. You know what's interesting about hiring another attorney? I read an article the other day where there was a person that was trying to be evicted. They were trying to evict him in New York. And he'd managed to stay in the house for years, if not a decade or more. And they, he literally had hired and fired many attorneys. And the strategy was, I hired a new attorney. They've got to get up to speed on the case. So we need an emergency extension of time. What happens Sunday night? Sure as shooting. This girl hires an attorney. He files an electronic motion at 8, a, at 8 p.m. on a Sunday to try to stop the eviction the Monday morning. My attorney gets word of that, calls us up at 6 a.m. and says, there's a filing that's been headed into the court. The judge could hear it this morning. Our eviction time is 8 a.m. What's this woman trying to do? What's her game? What's her strategy? How many times has she played this record? Right? So what happens? 8 o'clock comes. The constables show up. The movers show up. The constable says, this house is packed to the gills. you got to have at least six people there. We plan on 12, end up with 10. We bring 10 people to the job. And what happens? There's a rain cloud over the house. So what do we do? We got all this money invested in people and time, attorneys working to get this woman out. We probably spent, you know, probably a thousand dollars in legal fees from Sunday night at eight till the morning when, the, when our attorney's working with the judges and everyone to get them off of their humanitarian aid. So he looks up and says, if that cloud starts to shower and our guy looks up in the air and says, well, it's the only cloud, it'll probably move by. Luckily, the cloud didn't drop rain that day, right? It ended up being a clear day all day yesterday. Second thing, there were four constables to show up to the, that showed up to this eviction. Two of the normal worker bees and the, and the captain and the sergeant or whoever it was, right? So now you got how much of the government's money in play to evict this woman. We were supposed to evict at 8 o'clock. Didn't happen. These guys were on the phone with the judge, the courts, everyone. This lady climbs in her car and drives to the court and gets in front of the judge physically. At the end, we happen to draw the better card, right? The judge denies the emergency motion, says we'll hear the case on the 27th, which is another eight days away. And, and finally, four cops make us wait an hour. We're spending all this money and time. Our attorney's on the phone. The four cops get the go ahead from the judge and we start moving furniture out of the house. At some point about two hours later, we finally get the judge's order and he said that her emergency motion was denied. Four hours later, all of that person's stuff is out on the lawn. And guess what? The guy that's in dreads, that's in the house smoking pot, well, he comes out of the house and he is sending all kinds of expletives to the cops, to this, to that. 
He's arguing and fighting and whining and moaning. He then goes and gets a U-Haul truck. And the cops tell us to load his truck for him. Can you believe that? Our labor evicting this guy and we're loading his U-Haul for him. How much can these guys play the system? Where has humanity gone to? I mean, the businessman in the business world today, if you're in my business, you end up having to be extremely shrewd to people that are in their homes. Because if, they, if you're not shrewd, you're going to get played. This lady got kicked out on her rear yesterday. And here's the funny thing about it. When the house was finally emptied out and all of the furniture's on the ground, we still got a hearing to go to on the 27th where she's suing everyone. What's going to happen with that hearing? I can tell you what's going to happen with that hearing. The minute she's out and she's lost possession, she's not going to invest any more time in the case. Now she may, this woman might just play the system out even longer and drag everyone through thousands of court fees as she runs in pro se and does as much as she possibly can. This is what we call a professional squatter. This is an individual who has played the hearts of the judge, the constable, the people that work with me, the attorney who came on. He has played their hearts like a violin. And who am I? I'm that big mean ogre who's going to kick that woman out of her house. And you know what? I do it with joy in my heart. And the reason why is because she's not going to play me. It's sad but true. At the end of the day, you got to be aware of the professional squatters. This is Craig Brooksby with the Estates LLC signing out. Everyone have a blessed day. Bye-bye.